10. Radioactive Vehicle Graveyard Near the village of Rosoka, on the outskirts of the Chernobyl Exclusion Zone, there's a graveyard filled with dozens of irradiated vehicles that were used in the cleanup effort following the nuclear disaster. These buses, tanks, helicopters, fire trucks, and other machines played varying roles in the operation. Some participated in cleaning the debris from the explosion or dropped materials over the collapsed reactor, while others worked on the construction of the steel shelter that was built to cover the reactor, known as the sarcophagus. These projects left the vehicles far too contaminated with radiation for anyone to use them ever again. Site managers decided it would be best to just bury them, but they lacked the resources to put every single one in the ground. Instead, they simply parked them on various parcels of land, including the one outside Rosoka. Nearby residents were evacuated elsewhere to prevent them from continued exposure to deadly radiation levels, which were 800 times higher than normal following the disaster. 9. Red Forest One of the most contaminated places near Chernobyl, known as the Red Forest, occupies a 4-square-mile, 11-square-kilometer area that was once filled with pine trees that died in the disaster. Named for the ginger-brown color the trees turned from the effects of the radiation that poisoned them, the forest was completely bulldozed after the accident. Workers buried the poisonous vegetation in waste graveyards, but the site remains highly dangerous to this day. It's located in what's known as the Zone of Alienation, which received the most heavy pollution from the Chernobyl catastrophe. In addition to destroying plants, the radiation contaminated soil, water, and the atmosphere to the tune of 20 times the levels involved in the atomic bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Despite being one of the world's most radioactive sites, the Red Forest became a shockingly diverse wildlife refuge after the human population was evacuated. There's no doubt that the radioactivity has affected the region's flora and fauna, but the full nature and extent of the impacts is unknown. Most of the ongoing concerns surrounding the Red Forest have to do with its soil, which seem to contain the vast majority of the site's radiation. The damage could last for several more generations, according to experts, and it'll certainly be a long time before it's safe for people to go there. 8. The Black Bird of Chernobyl in the days leading up to the 1986 Chernobyl nuclear disaster, workers from the plant's control room claimed to have seen a massive humanoid creature with large wings and glowing red eyes. They claimed that it rose over the horizon and stared down at the city of Pripyat, as if to warn them that danger was looming. Those who saw the monster, nicknamed the Black Bird of Chernobyl, were reportedly plagued by nightmares and threatening phone calls. Some believed that the creature was a version of the ominous Mothman, which is said to appear as a warning of bad things to come. Sydney-based archaeologist Robert Maxwell told news.com.au that he first heard of the Black Bird of Chernobyl while conducting field work within the exclusion zone in recent years. He learned that in addition to witnessing the creature in the days leading up to the disaster, many of the control room workers also claimed to have seen it moments before the catastrophe struck. Maxwell admitted that the Black Bird legend is one of the so-called safe tales that circulate about Chernobyl. What he means is that it's hard to check the veracity of the claims, because it's easy to claim that the control room workers who allegedly saw the creature are dead, or that their sightings were never officially recorded. In this sense, it could explain why the legend didn't seem to appear until 2005 or why it persists so strongly today. We'll probably never know for sure what the workers saw or what exactly it was. 7. Old Ladies if you haven't noticed, not everyone cooperates with evacuation orders, and Chernobyl was no exception. While some 116,000 people were evacuated from the exclusion zone in an immediate sense, some people, particularly those who were set in their ways, refused to stay away from their homes for too long and eventually came back. The Soviet government relocated almost everyone from the exclusion zone into apartments, minus this small minority of mostly older individuals who simply didn't care about the rules or the claims that their health would be in danger if they returned to the area. This population included an estimated 1,200 so-called self-settlers, mostly over the age of 48. Of those who still remain, 80% are women, and as you can probably imagine, they're pretty old. These stubborn senior citizens are well aware of the risks associated with choosing to live in a radioactive environment, but their desire for the familiarity of their homesteads apparently outweighed any fear of the potential consequences. They grow food and raise livestock, despite knowing that the soil and pretty much everything around them is contaminated. And miraculously, many of these babushkas have enjoyed long and seemingly healthy lives. The fact that they've survived into their 70s and 80s is apparently all the evidence they need to support their decision to live in the exclusion zone. If you had to be evacuated from your home due to radiation, would you ever return? Tell us in the comments and hit subscribe while you're at it.
6. Mutated Animals While some of the more stubborn civilians who were evacuated from the Chernobyl exclusion zone saw no issue with returning, there was an undeniable uptick in deformed farm animals following the disaster. The first spell of this lasted for around six months, as authorities worked diligently to clean up and contain the mess, but their initial efforts were unfortunately in vain. It happened again in 1989 and 1990, and these occurrences are thought to have coincided with the first few failed attempts to build a sarcophagus around the nuclear reactor that exploded. In other words, radiation leaked from the structure and caused mutations to rise. The deformities were more than evident and took the form of malformed faces, extra limbs, dwarfism, and unnatural colors. Cattle, pigs, goats, horses, and other domestic livestock were affected by the bizarre changes. Sadly, in many cases, the mutations were so extreme that the animals only lived for a few hours. Hundreds died, including 400 in 1990 alone. Even those who were born without deformities but who were exposed to the nuclear fallout were impacted, including cows who produced radioactive milk. Since the accident, nearly the entire exclusion zone has remained free of humans and domesticated animals. Most of this territory has been reclaimed by nature, including plants and wild animals, turning the area into a de facto radioactive wildlife refuge. There are around 900 stray dogs who live in the region. Volunteer veterinarians vaccinate, tag them, and fit them with radiation detector collars, which helps to track radiation levels in the zone. Some species are noticeably absent from the exclusion zone, including invertebrates or creatures without a backbone, like bees, butterflies, spiders, and grasshoppers. They didn't fare as well as other animals, and their populations never recovered. And while bird populations have largely recovered, some face ongoing issues due to the high radiation levels, including smaller-than-average brains. 5. The Sarcophagus Attempts to contain the radiation at Chernobyl date back to shortly after the disaster with the construction of the first sarcophagus. Workers assembled the original sarcophagus in rotating five to seven minute shifts because that was the limit for how long they could work without putting their lives imminently at risk. But any exposure that didn't kill them was likely to subject them to a lifetime of radiation-related health problems. The original sarcophagus failed to contain the radiation from the destroyed nuclear reactor, which continued to seep into the ground and the environment, contaminating anything even remotely nearby, including soil, water, and the atmosphere. Over a span of more than 20 years, engineers worked to develop a better solution, which turned out to be a new and improved sarcophagus. The massive steel and concrete structure, known as the New Safe Confinement, is designed to contain the radiation and protect the environment while work continues on destroying the reactor and cleaning up the massive mess left behind by the disaster. The new sarcophagus will hopefully function for at least 100 years before a new containment structure will need to be built, and by then, hopefully enough progress has been made on the cleanup to require a smaller and less expensive solution. It was rolled onto the site on a set of custom purpose-built tracks, making it the largest moving man-made structure ever built. Thanks to the newly built sarcophagus, which has been in place since 2016, hundreds of tons of lava-like corium, hazardous dust, and other radioactive materials are safely confined and are no longer leaking into the surrounding environment. In the meantime, a multi-part system has been implemented for processing and eliminating the waste over time. Radiation levels in and around the sarcophagus are carefully monitored to ensure workers' safety. 4. Abnormal Decomposition there's no doubt that the nuclear disaster at Chernobyl dramatically affected plant and animal life within the exclusion zone. The most obvious effect of these sudden influx of radioactive pollution was the massive killing off of vegetation and wildlife. But scientists were surprised to realize that dead plants don't seem to decompose nearly as fast within the exclusion zone as they do in a normal setting. What this means is that the radiation has had a slowing effect on microbes, fungi, and certain insects that play key roles in breaking down dead organisms. Scientists have estimated that so-called leaf litter in the exclusion zone is as much as two to three times thicker than it would be elsewhere. And even some animals that have been caught and killed outside the exclusion zone, and in some cases as far away as Germany, have taken an oddly long time to decay. There are numerous drawbacks to this unusual preservation, including not only the high levels of radioactive contamination that come with it, but also the risk of forest fires. With so much dry brush piling up on the forest floor, there's a much higher chance of a catastrophic blaze, which, as we're sure you can imagine, is one of the last things anyone would want to happen anywhere near the disaster site. 3. 
giant catfish. In 2016, footage of a giant catfish swimming around in Chernobyl's cooling pond surfaced online, sparking rumors that the creatures were mutants whose size grew out of control from radiation. Many news headlines fed into the hype, rather than telling readers the truth that the catfish were not mutated by nuclear contamination. Speaking with the International Business Times about another suspected case of massive radioactive fish in 2015, University of South Carolina radiation specialist Dr. Timothy Mousseau explained that very, very few mutations lead to extra-large size. He further explained that, on the contrary, most mutated animals grow less efficiently because they're less capable of finding food and they tend to not live as long. The massive catfish in the Chernobyl cooling pond are of a perfectly normal size for their species. Known as Wells catfish, it's customary for them to weigh as much as 350 pounds, 158 kilograms if the conditions are right. There are even stories of Wells catfish growing even bigger, but it's rare. But fishermen have certainly caught specimens that outweigh the fish at Chernobyl, which are pretty ordinary despite their impressive size. 2. Silhouette Graffiti at some point after the 1986 nuclear disaster at Chernobyl, graffiti artists rumored to be from Germany or Belarus broke into the highly radioactive former city and plastered the sides of its buildings with human silhouettes. In fact, they left the eerie artwork all over the exclusion zone, perhaps as a reminder of the former human presence in the now silent and abandoned region. The silhouettes are said to represent Pripyat's missing residents, who disappeared amidst the chaos that followed the accident. In one room, there's a little girl with pigtails reaching for a light switch, and on the outside of another building, a little boy pulls a toy trunk toward the corner. Other silhouettes show people dancing, jumping, and holding each other, although it's unclear whether they're doing so out of excitement or fear. Perhaps the meanings behind these mysterious pieces were deliberately left obscure and were meant to be interpreted by the viewer. Either way, these so-called permanent shadows serve as the only remaining sign of human life that has not populated the city in nearly 40 years now. 1. Soviet Propaganda Pripyat's 50,000 residents were evacuated 36 hours after the nuclear disaster struck. They all expected to return within a short amount of time because that's what they were told would happen, so most people didn't take much beyond their identification documents and a few days' worth of clothing and personal belongings. Their time away ended up being permanent, as we all know today, and the population's hasty departure left the city essentially frozen in time. While what's left of the city is weathered and deteriorating, it otherwise still looks much like it did the day its residents left, with no more than an armful or two of belongings, with plans to come back soon. Consequently, Pripyat offers a rare glimpse of what everyday life in a Soviet-era closed city was like. Its remains are littered with remnants of a bygone era, including large portraits of Soviet leaders and a statue of a soldier that survived the test of time surrounded by crumbling ruins, making it seem all the more resilient. There are also large murals promoting the Soviet culture and way of life, and reflecting the political climate at the time, which people were expected to go along with and never question or challenge. Number 10. A Martian Mineral A Martian mineral called Jerosite, which is rarely seen on Earth, was recently found beneath the Antarctic ice. The yellow-brown substance requires water and acidic conditions to form, according to NASA, and is found abundantly on Mars, despite the red planet's modern conditions not being conducive to its formation. Scientists have long wondered how Jerosite became so plentiful on Mars. Some believe that the planet was once covered in ice, facilitating the process necessary for the mineral to form. The recently discovered presence of it in Antarctica helps to support this theory, according to the claims of researchers who published a study earlier this year in the journal Nature Communications. Jerosite typically occurs on Earth when mining waste is exposed to rain and air, and it also forms near volcano vents. The team that discovered it in Antarctica, led by geologist Giovanni Bacolo, did not expect to find it when they detected trace amounts in the deepest layers of a mile-long ice core they extracted. Using an electron microscope, the researchers examined the particles and determined that the jerosite formed within ice pockets, indicating that the jerosite on Mars may have occurred the same way. Bacolo remarked that this is just the first step in linking deep Antarctic ice with the Martian environment. Number 9. Ice Rings in Siberia for decades, scientists were perplexed by bizarre ice rings that appear every year on the frozen surface of Lake Baikal in Siberia. A team led by NASA hydrologist Alexei Kurev got to the bottom of the mystery in 2020 when they studied the water beneath the ice using sensors that measure the water's salinity and temperature. 
They found that the rings are caused by small circular currents called eddies, and that the water at the edges of the eddies melted the rings into the ice from below. Kurev said that the eddies circulate in a clockwise direction, and that the water in the eddies is 2 to 4 degrees Fahrenheit warmer than the surrounding water. But the ice above the centers of the eddies didn't melt because the current was weaker in the middle. The ice rings usually appear in March or April and typically measure 3 to 4 miles in diameter. Because they're so large, people don't see them at ground level, and they're only detectable from a bird's eye view, which partially explains why they went unnoticed for so long until recently. Sometimes the rings last for just a few days, but they also often last for weeks or even months. Ever since solving the puzzle about what causes the rings, scientists have moved on to trying to figure out what causes the eddies throughout the lake. Number 8. A Missing Man Russia's Yakusha region is the world's coldest populated region. Even during the summer, temperatures drop as low as 4 degrees Fahrenheit. Winters are much more brutal. In January, the average temperature is minus 40 degrees Fahrenheit. In August of 2021, a 45-year-old father of three named Yegor Krivoshapkin vanished in Yakusha. Given the region's climate, the outlook was grim to begin with, but the odds of finding Krivoshapkin alive grew extremely thin as the days turned into weeks. After six weeks of searching, authorities gave up and cautioned the missing man's family to be realistic about his odds of survival and that it was pretty much impossible for him to be alive at that point. But the family refused to give up hope and continued to do everything in their power to find Krivoshapkin. To everyone's surprise, he appeared at a remote campsite very much alive two months after his disappearance. He was disoriented and had somehow ended up 190 miles from where he vanished. For weeks on end, Krivoshapkin had wandered the Siberian tundra and slept beneath trees. He had somehow defied all odds and miraculously survived. The community was shocked that he had managed to avoid freezing to death or being killed by wild animals. What was even more surprising is that frostbite appeared to be his only injury. Luckily, he was still able to walk. He later explained that he had found 40-year-old tinned food in the snow and ate it to stay alive. The food had been dropped from an aircraft during Soviet times as emergency sustenance for lost herders. This was the second time Krivoshapkin went missing. Two years earlier, he became disoriented by forest fires and got lost. He was found two months later, 75 miles from where he disappeared. Hopefully, it doesn't happen again because he may not be so lucky next time. Number 7. Frozen Fish Wall In 2017, a photograph of frozen fish embedded in a four-foot wall of ice went viral after initially appearing on the U.S. Department of Interior's Twitter page. The image shows several dead fish positioned in various directions and angles, as if they suddenly froze while they were in the middle of swimming around. Photographer Kelly Preheim snapped the photo two years earlier in 2015 in South Dakota's Lake Andes National Wildlife Refuge. According to the Weather Channel, it was right at the end of a particularly brutal winter. Preheim said that the fish died from depleted oxygen levels in the water resulting from drought. The thick ice blocked out the sun's rays, preventing algae and other aquatic plants from growing and further lowering oxygen levels in the water. Simply put, it spelled disaster for the fish. Numerous species died and floated to the water's surface, and their decomposing remains used up yet more oxygen as they became encrusted in ice. As the ice continued to expand amid cold weather, it pushed toward the shore and the slab containing frozen fish buckled and went vertical in Preheim's words. As sad as the fish's death may seem, their remains attracted bald eagles, gulls, and other animals to the area. Previously ravaged by an overpopulation of invasive fish species, the lake and its surroundings had a chance to reset, thanks to the drought. Number 6. Mummified Baby Mammoth A gold miner in Canada's Yukon Territory recently discovered the near-complete mummified remains of a female baby woolly mammoth. He was digging through the permafrost at the Klondike gold fields when he found the ancient creature whose skin and hair are still intact. The Yukon is a hotbed of Ice Age animal fossils, but the discovery of such a remarkably preserved animal is extremely rare, especially since scientists estimate that she died around 30,000 years ago. During that time, she likely shared the landscape with cave lions, giant steppe bison, and wild horses. She's been named Nun Choga, which means big baby animal in the indigenous Han language. A government press release described the creature as the most intact and the only near-complete woolly mammoth ever found in North America. Local First Nations authorities are working with the government to preserve the specimen and learn more about her. Number 5. Fecal Fuel 
Polar explorer Jürgen Brunlund met an unglamorous end when he died in a cave in Greenland, frostbitten and starving in 1907. The Greenland-born Inuit was the last member of his expedition's three-man team to perish and the only one whose remains were ever found. As he lay dying, Brunlund wrote his last thoughts in a journal that had a heavy black smudge on one of its pages. For a long time, experts struggled to determine what the mystery substance was. In 2020, scientists performed an analysis using new technology and detected traces of oil, burned rubber, and feces, leading them to suspect that Brunlund desperately tried using every material he could think of to light a petroleum burner. But his attempts failed, and he died in the harsh conditions he was trapped in. Brunlund met his fate during the team's return trip to their base camp. His fellow explorers, Milius Eriksson and Niels Peter Hoeghagen, had already died from exposure and exhaustion by the time he found shelter in the cave. The diary contains details about where the men's bodies were, but nobody ever found them. Members of another expedition discovered Brunlund's body and belongings in 1908. They buried him where he died and kept the diary, which, as you can see, researchers are still learning from today. What do you think happened to the bodies of the other two explorers? Let us know in the comments below and hit subscribe while you're at it. Number 4. Live Alligators Unlike most of the animals on today's list, frozen alligators that were discovered in 2019 were perfectly alive and well. As a cold blast gripped North Carolina, gators at the Swamp Park in Ocean Isle East froze in place with their noses poking out of the water, enabling them to breathe and survive in the frigid weather. Altogether, 18 gators froze at the park and they remained frozen the entire next day, manager George Howard told the Charlotte Observer. It seemed as if they stuck their noses into the air precisely as the water froze, at just the right moment, as Howard put it. Alligators go into a hibernation-like state called brumation, also known as icing when water or air temperatures are too low for them to remain active, enabling them to live in water temperatures as low as 40 degrees, at which point they become lethargic. This was the second year in a row that alligators were discovered frozen with their snouts in the air at the 65-acre park. They thawed out after spending a few days in a deep freeze with no apparent injuries. When a cold front swept the nation earlier this year, gators at the Red Slough Wildlife Management Area in McCurtain County, Oklahoma resorted to the same survival method. While brumation keeps gators alive in unnaturally frigid weather, it's not ideal for these cold-blooded creatures, who rely on their external surroundings to regulate their body temperature. Number 3. Resurrected Worms in 2018, scientists announced that they had successfully revived two ancient worm species that spent tens of thousands of years in a state of suspended animation in the Siberian permafrost. The team's findings described the microscopic nematodes as the first known examples of multicellular organisms returning to life after spending so long in a deep freeze. Nematodes measure just one millimeter long on average but are extremely resilient little creatures. Some are found living as far as 0.8 miles below ground, deeper than any other multicellular organisms. And while they are extremely adept at surviving in varied environments, the ability to come back to life after over 30,000 years was a serious game changer that supersedes all their other impressive qualities. For the study, scientists examined two samples containing well-preserved nematodes from two different parts of Siberia. They separated and defrosted the females, and soon after, the researchers noticed the worms moving and eating. The next mission for experts is to better understand the mechanisms that enable the nematodes to return to life after being frozen for so long. Number 2. Giant Wolf Head In 2018, local resident Pavel Efimov discovered the severed head of a prehistoric wolf in northern Yakutia's Abieski district. The adult wolf died around 32,000 years ago when it was between two and four years old, according to scientists. Its fur and teeth are still intact, and even more impressively, it's the first fully grown ancient wolf ever discovered with its soft tissue and brain preserved. The head measures 15.7 inches long, roughly half the length of a modern wolf's entire body. Hailing from an extinct lineage that is distinct from modern wolves, it's the first adult Pleistocene era carcass of a steppe wolf ever discovered. It's unknown how the animal's head was severed and what happened to the rest of its remains. Evolutionary geneticist Love Delen and other experts have said that there's no evidence to indicate that humans were responsible, according to Smithsonian Magazine. Scientists announced plans to try extracting the creature's DNA in hopes of sequencing its genome and learning more about the evolution of modern wolves. Number 1. Message in a Bottle in July 1959, American geologist Paul T. Walker left a message in a glass bottle at a cairn near a glacier on Ward Hunt Island in Canada's High Arctic. The note asked the reader to measure the distance between the glacier and the rock formation it was left in. 
and then mail the information to his lab. Walker's goal was to determine if and by how much the glacier retreated. Most of his contemporaries expected the opposite to happen, but as it turns out, Walker's notions were far ahead of his time. The cairn he left the bottle in was four feet away from the glacier when Walker placed it there. Sadly, he never saw his experiment to fruition, as he passed away several months later. 54 years later in 2013, researchers Warwick Vincent and Dennis Sarazen found the bottle and its note. They honored the late geologist's wish and calculated that the glacier had retreated 233 feet since 1954. It's a story about climate change, but it's also a story about the incredibly brave and strong men who worked in this extreme high Arctic environment in the 1950s. Back before GPS and sat phone technology, Vincent told Grind TV Outdoor, this is the most remote part of North America and the coldest coastal zone. Walker was unsure whether the glacier was retreating, but his seemingly predictive suspicions are chilling, especially at a time when our planet is in the throes of major climate change. Number 10. Military Training Exercise Gone Wrong During a routine training exercise near Prague Ruzhnia Airport in July 1941, a Luftwaffe aircraft lost control on its approach to landing and crashed into at least one home in the village of Yenicek. Both pilots were killed instantly and the plane was completely destroyed. And while it's clear based on this photo that the house was heavily damaged, luckily no civilians were harmed. The aircraft was a Heinkel HE-111 bomber. It was designed in the 1930s during a time when Germany was banned from building bombers in accordance with the restrictions imposed on the country after World War I, so its developers disguised it as a civilian aircraft. But all along, it was intended as a combat-ready heavy bomber for the Luftwaffe, earning it the reputation of a wolf in sheep's clothing. During the war's early stages, the Heinkel HE-111 was the most heavily used and produced German aircraft of its kind. But it became obsolete later in the war as aviation technology rapidly advanced among Allied forces. By the end of the conflict, the plane was no longer being produced. Number 9. Blackout Failures Starting in the fall of 1940, the Germans began bombing the United Kingdom in what became known as the Blitz. As the news spread, authorities throughout the U.S. became increasingly concerned about making sure that the population was properly prepared for air raids. To reduce the visibility of potential targets, cities across the country imposed practice blackouts, requiring homes and businesses to turn off all their outside lights and cover their windows with thick drapes or blankets. Car headlights and flashlights were also banned during blackouts. For the most part, civilians cooperated. But people resisted blackouts in some places, including in numerous towns and cities along the East Coast. And by staying lit up at night, they cast a glow that enabled German U-boat crews to spot the silhouettes of American ships. They sank so many vessels that early 1942 became known to the Nazis as the Second Happy Time. This had also happened in Britain during a period the Germans called the First Happy Time. The U.S. government got involved to try getting reluctant cities to cooperate, but the attempts to impose blackouts were continuously met with resistance in some places. Altogether, over 400 American ships, including civilian vessels, were sunk by German U-boats off Cape Hatteras, North Carolina, in an area that became known as Torpedo Alley. Number 8. Dunkirk Evacuation France and Britain declared war on Germany in 1939 following the Nazi invasion of Poland. The British Expeditionary Force, BEF, was deployed to France to help defend the country, but soon found themselves trapped by the enemy, along with other Allied soldiers. In late May, Nazi forces charged through the Ardennes and headed up toward the English Channel. They cut off and surrounded Belgian, British, and French troops following the six-week Battle of France, stranding them at the beaches and harbor of Dunkirk along the country's northern coastline. British Prime Minister Winston Churchill described the stranding as a colossal military disaster and said that the whole root and core and brain of the British Army was at risk of perishing or being captured. Between May 26th and June 4th of 1940, Allied forces evacuated from the beaches and harbor of Dunkirk in northern France. Codenamed Operation Dynamo, the mission sought to recover tens of thousands of men in just a few days. Hundreds of small watercraft, including many who volunteered their help, ferried soldiers onto waiting military ships. In the meantime, the British Royal Air Force was tasked with providing air cover for the operation and fighting back against the Luftwaffe, which bombed Dunkirk and cut off its water supply, leading to catastrophic fires and killing around a thousand civilians. Once ships were full, the next step was to take one of three evacuation routes, all which came with different risks. The initial outlook of the mission wasn't too optimistic, and of course the Germans depicted it to the public as their victory. But in terms of lives saved, Operation Dynamo was highly successful, leading to the evacuation of more than 338,000 Allied soldiers. Number 7. Inadequate Convoy Escorts 
Throughout World War II, both the American and the British militaries relied heavily on civilian merchant mariners to get supplies where they needed to go. These hundreds of thousands of courageous volunteers received little recognition at the time, but they're now often thought of as some of the war's unsung heroes, who routinely put their lives on the line and experienced a much higher casualty rate than most other war-related jobs. Merchant vessels often traveled in large, slow convoys and were a major target among German U-boats. Many convoys went unescorted or were accompanied by just a few ships that were equipped for anti-submarine warfare. The consequences of the decision to provide convoys with inadequate protection became evident in October of 1940, after 35 British merchant ships left Newfoundland, Canada for Liverpool, England, with just a single sloop as an escort. Known as Convoy SC-7, it puttered across the Atlantic at speeds as slow as eight knots, frustrating the captains of faster ships. Consequently, the convoy became separated and spread out. By the time the vessels approached Ireland, more escorts had become available, but the merchant ships were so scattered that there was no realistic way to defend them all. Twenty of them were sunk by German U-boats, resulting in the deaths of the crew members and a shipping loss of nearly 80,000 tons. The U.S. eventually stepped in to help protect British merchant mariner ships after it became clear that the sinkings were having a devastating effect on the U.K.'s power in the war. Number 6. Clark Field when the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor on December 7, 1941, General Douglas MacArthur was stationed in the Philippines, where he was in charge of a fleet of dozens of fighter planes. Military personnel were quickly made aware of the Pearl Harbor attack, knowing that the Japanese were likely headed toward the Philippines next. Pilots remained on standby, ready to fight on a moment's notice, with many even sitting in their planes and waiting for the go-ahead from their superiors. Eight hours passed between the Pearl Harbor attack and the Japanese attack on U.S. forces at Clark Field on Luzon Island. Military commanders had plenty of time to prepare and to disperse fighter aircraft, but the planes remained parked in a field and Japanese bombers arrived shortly before 1 o'clock p.m. By the end of the first day, they managed to reduce the American Far East Air Force's strength by half in what some call the other Pearl Harbor. The Japanese then invaded by land and months of fighting ensued, resulting in catastrophic losses for the Americans, who surrendered on May 6, 1942. There was never any official investigation into why U.S. forces took no action before the attack after receiving ample warning, leaving many questions unanswered to this day and making it unclear where the blame lies. And while the Americans wouldn't have been able to repel the Japanese attack entirely, they may have been able to slow the advance and avoid many losses of both men and aircraft. Number 5. Malfunctioning Torpedoes the U.S. Navy's submarines were manned by very capable crews and managed to inflict a sizable amount of damage on the Japanese Navy and merchant fleet throughout the war. But it's been argued that they could have been even more effective if high-ranking officials had taken complaints about malfunctioning torpedoes more seriously. Crews reported numerous times that torpedoes had hit or passed beneath a target without detecting it and exploding like they were supposed to. Instead of looking for flaws in the torpedo's magnetic exploders, superiors blamed the submarine skippers and claimed that the weapons were in perfect working order. In at least two instances, Americans unintentionally sank their own submarines after firing a torpedo and having it circle back to its launching point. It wasn't until 1943 that Navy officials finally addressed the problems with the faulty torpedoes. By then, the U.S. submarine fleet had established itself as a successful and highly deadly weapon against the Japanese. Still, some say that it could have been even better if not for all the bureaucratic red tape surrounding the torpedo issue. Number 4. The Maginot Line during the 1930s, France built a series of concrete structures along its borders with Italy, Switzerland, Luxembourg, and Belgium. The 280-mile-long string of fortifications known as the Maginot Line was meant to prevent a German invasion by forcing the Nazis to go around the structures and through the thick Ardennes forest, which the French believed was impossible. Despite being extremely well-built, the Maginot Line was a huge failure. Its designs had relied mainly on their knowledge of past wars and had failed to consider the potential of up-and-coming technology. When the time came for Hitler's forces to get past the line, they simply barreled through the woods using tanks. They surrounded the French and their British allies, pushing them back toward the coast, and took 500,000 prisoners of war as they successfully captured the Maginot Line. The French reoccupied the structures after the war, but ultimately abandoned them in 1966. Parts of the Maginot Line were auctioned off, while others were simply left to deteriorate. The military continued to use one section into the 1990s, but cleared out completely after the Soviet Union fell. Today, some of the structures are used as wine cellars, a mushroom farm, and a disco. Number 3 the Dakar debacle. After France fell to the Nazis in 1940, General Charles de Gaulle became the self-declared leader of the Free French Forces who opposed the newly installed Vichy government. 
In a mission codenamed Operation Manas, he teamed up with British military commanders in a plot to capture Dakar, the capital of the former colony of French West Africa and the modern-day capital of Senegal. At the time, the port city was under the control of the Vichy regime, and both the British and de Gaulle saw it as a strategically beneficial move to capture Dakar. In early July, a joint British and French detachment was dispatched to carry out the mission, and at first, they avoided physical combat. In fact, de Gaulle seemed pretty confident that he could persuade the Vichy forces at Dakar to join in the fight against the Nazis. But the soldiers at the naval base responded with gunfire and they refused to back down. The fighting continued into the night, prompting the Free French and British to wonder if they should withdraw. British Prime Minister Winston Churchill instructed them to stop at nothing and fight to the end. But the Vichy forces proved to be tougher than anyone had anticipated, and the Allied losses started to tally up. At that point, de Gaulle realized that the only options were to intensify the attack, which would put civilian lives at risk, or to accept defeat and leave. Still, his superiors ordered him to keep fighting, but it was clearly a lost cause and the Allies soon retreated. They would later learn that the Vichy governor had felt similarly about how things were going from their side of the battle and was considering surrendering before the Allies left. For the British, Operation Manasse was a humiliating failure and it had no better of an effect on de Gaulle, whose strategic shortcomings were exposed through his overconfidence about the Allies' ability to overtake Dakar at the time. The Allies did eventually seize control of the region, but not until two years later and with a much better thought-out strategy. Number 2. Ignoring de Gaulle's Advice during the interwar period and before he became the president of France, Charles de Gaulle was a high-ranking French military officer. Before World War II really took off, he called for a deployment of tanks separate from the infantry to cut behind the enemy's flanks much like horse-mounted cavalry had done in previous wars. But his unconventional views on how to use tanks were rejected, only for the Germans to use the same tactic that de Gaulle had recommended. This is one of several mistakes that the French made by planning for a defensive war. They felt protected by the Maginot Line blockades that had been built to stop the Germans from passing through areas that lacked thick forestry that the French believed would also stop the Nazis. But they were in for a rude awakening when on May 10, 1940, the Germans barreled through the Ardennes using panzer tanks. The French were ill-prepared to launch counterattacks because they hadn't planned for any of this to happen. The fighting lasted for over a month in what became known as the Battle of France, resulting in a German victory and hundreds of thousands of Allied casualties. While it's hard to say what the outcome would have been if de Gaulle's colleagues had taken his advice, many believe that his ideas may have secured an Allied victory at best and led to fewer losses at worst. Number 1. HMS Prince of Wales and Repulse In 1941, the British battleships HMS Prince of Wales and HMS Repulse were sent to the Malay Peninsula to patrol the waters off Singapore and protect the territory from the Japanese. Crewed by experienced soldiers, both vessels arrived with recently updated and strengthened anti-aircraft batteries. On December 8, 1941, shortly after ravaging Pearl Harbor, the Japanese carried out an air raid over the Malay Peninsula. British Admiral Tom Phillips sent the Prince of Wales and Repulse out onto the open sea, where both ships were bombed and torpedoed, resulting in heavy casualties. It's possible that Phillips believed that the Royal Air Force was equipped to provide air cover for the ships, but by that point the Allied Air Forces had been greatly weakened by the Japanese, so this simply wasn't the case. His misjudgment earned the Prince of Wales and the Repulse the distinction of being the first capital ships that were shot down by aircraft alone. Thanks for watching. Which of these mistakes from World War II do you think was the most avoidable? Let us know in the comments below and don't forget to subscribe. Thanks again and we'll see you next time for another amazing video right here on American Eye.